What is going on my friends? Ryan Williams here back with another one and oh my goodness, what a wild week it was on the stock market. For the week, the Dow finished at a loss of 1.25%, the Nasdaq was down over 4% and the S&P finished down almost 2%. Now I can only imagine what the rest of the month is going to bring, but with these drops in the market comes great buying opportunities, which is something that we dividend investors wait so patiently for. With that said, today we are going to be discussing four dividend stocks that have most definitely followed suit with the market and really, to be honest, have been doing nothing but coming down in share price. The four dividend stocks we're talking about today are all down for the year, some for even longer, and today we'll be taking a look to see if they may be some good ones to add to your portfolio right now. So that's what we have coming up first. And then later on in this video, I'll be taking you guys through my weekly dividend portfolio update where I'll be sharing with you how my portfolio performed in the last week, which a uh, spoiler alert, it's not been great. And I'll also share with you guys which stocks I bought this week and also what I plan to buy in the upcoming week. So be sure to stick around for that. Anyway, before we get rocking and rolling, if you guys are stoked to talk about some dividend stocks that have just been really beaten down in share price, then go ahead and give this video a big thumbs up. Also, leave me a comment below and let me know which stocks you guys plan to buy in the upcoming week. I'd be very curious to hear what investing moves you all are planning on making. Anyway, thank you so much for doing that. And now, without further ado, Let's get into it. All right, my friends. Now, the first stock we are going to be covering today is Bristol Myers Squibb, ticker symbol BMY. And it's been a while since I've mentioned this stock in any of my videos, except for maybe in reference to what's going on in my watch list. But uh, I'll tell you what, in the last couple of months, since the last time I, I probably mentioned this video, this stock has become even cheaper and is looking even more affordable than it was in the past, which this stock, at least for the last handful of months, has been at a, a pretty substantial discount. And as you guys can see on the screen right over here, just in the last year, BMY is down almost 11%, okay? And then in the last six months, it's down even more, down 14.35%, which is pretty hefty. And then going to the one month performance, it is down about five and a half percent. And then just in the last five days, just this week, this stock is down another 2%. But it really doesn't stop there, guys. This stock has kind of been beaten down for even longer than the last year. I mean, if we zoom out to the last five years, it's really not had hardly any movement and any sort of movement it has had has been negative. So, I mean, you can see right here, it's down about 1% just in the last five years. So if you were to buy this stock, you know, back at the end of 2016, you're gonna be sitting in pretty much the same position now that you were then. Anyway, let's move on and scroll down and see what the Seeking Alpha Bulls have to say about BMY. I know there's some good things ahead. So uh, the first one here says, the company has a compelling pipeline which allows sustainable growth rates despite upcoming LOEs of RevLimid and Polymist. Its valuation is very cheap considering free cash flow margins in the 40s. Yeah, so BMY does have a pretty high free cash flow margin. That's great to see and that bodes well for us as dividend investors. Uh, moving on to point number two, BMY shares look as much as 50% undervalued. Wow, that's quite a bit. After the recent sell-off, based on promised long-term revenue growth, prospects of about 5%. Ford PE of about eight, and then rapid deleveraging, which is good. They're paying down some debt. Number three, BMY may be an ideal choice for growth, dividend growth, and value. Management is exercising financial discipline by continuing to pay down debt. So that all looks pretty good, my friends, especially this part right here about BMY being as much as 50% undervalued. That would be pretty substantial if that turns out to be the case. And I'm sure it depends on how you're analyzing it and whatnot. But um, at any rate, let's scroll up and take a look at the valuation, some of the metrics behind that. So BMY has a Ford PE ratio of 7.39, which we can see right here, which is extremely low. And this also happens to be about 45% lower than this company's five-year average PE ratio. So this company is considerably cheaper than it has been historically. And the PE ratio of BMY also happens to be 65.5% lower than the sector median, which does also indicate some affordability compared to some of its other competitors, maybe like Pfizer or Moderna or Johnson & Johnson or some companies like that. Um, at any rate, guys, scrolling down, taking a look at the price to book, the Ford price to book, 3.28. We've seen higher, we've seen lower, but uh, you know, we'll take the price to book here. I mean, Seeking Alpha gives it a B minus. I do think it has some room to come down a little bit more and it looks like it's trending that way. As we see the share price of this company continue to go down, we'll also see this price to book continue to go down as well. Uh, moving on to the price to cash flow, 
forward price to cash flow of 7.38. It's in the single digits. It's actually right at about the same level as the PE ratio, which is very rare to see. I don't know that I've ever seen a price to cash flow pretty much equal a, a, a PE ratio. So all in all, I'd say just based on these three metrics, BMY is looking like it's at a good valuation. All right, guys, now scrolling up, let's jump over to the financials page and just run through a few quick metrics here on the income statement and balance sheet and um, cash flow statement here. So starting with the total revenue, we can see that BMY is trending up in this department, which is good. 2016 to 2017 is going up and then all the way to 2020. We saw a pretty big jump in revenue between 2019 and 2020. And then going over here, we can see that 2021 has seen an increase in revenue compared to the previous year as well. So this company is trending up and doing more sales compared to previous years, which is great to see. And then let's jump over to the balance sheet real quick. I wanna take a look at the debt and the shares outstanding. But before we scroll down, guys, let's just take a mental note real quick of the total cash on hand right now, which is 15.8 billion. We'll keep that in mind as we talk about the debt. So scrolling down, let's find that debt and also shares outstanding. So starting with shares outstanding right here, it looks like it was kind of trickling down a little bit but then in 2019 and 2020, that did jump up pretty substantially. Um, 2018 to 2019 had a pretty big jump. 2019 to 2020, it came down a little bit. And then 2020 till now, it also came down a little bit. Um, and this could be for a couple of reasons, which we'll talk about momentarily. But first, let's talk about this debt right here. So debt really jumped up between 2018 and 2019. And then to 2020, it jumped up even more. But between 2020 and now, they have paid down the debt quite a bit. Looks like they paid it down about $6 billion. Um, And the reason that this debt jumped up so much is due to a couple acquisitions that BMY made. So as you guys can see on the screen, back in October of last year, BMY acquired Myocardia for $13.1 billion. So that is at least partially responsible for the debt increase in that period of time. And then a year before that, they acquired another company, Celgene. So um, this also contributed to that huge debt and probably some of the increase in shares outstanding. But like we saw, guys, they are working on paying that back down. And it might take some time for them to get back down to uh, this debt level right here, but uh, they are headed in that direction. And even so, just remembering this um, cash on hand, 15.8 billion, you know, if they really had to, they obviously don't have enough cash to cover their debt, but they could pay down a great chunk of debt if they really needed to get rid of that cash and for whatever reason, pay some down. So I feel pretty comfortable with this debt level still. But anyway, scrolling up, let's go look at the cash flow and see how they're doing in the cash flow department. All right, guys, so scrolling down here, BMY, levered free cash flow right here. So looks like from 2016 till now, it really has been trending up quite nicely. Just like we saw with the revenue, there was a huge jump between 2019 and 2020. And then from 2020 until now, it looks like the free cash flow did take a little bit of a hit, but it's all good. This is still substantially higher than where they were at in previous years. So we'll see what 2022 brings, but um, this isn't super, super concerning to me, um, especially considering this free cash flow per share, guys, really has just gone up consistently. This is looking very nice. Um, and it's even gone up here in 2021, which is contradictory to what we saw here with the levered free cash flow. So as long as the free cash flow per share continues to go up, that makes me happy. Um, and brings me some comfort if I was to be investing in this company, which I don't have any in my portfolio. It is currently sitting on my watch list. Definitely a top contender for me if I was to add another healthcare company to my portfolio, but uh, I'm keeping an eye on it. But overall, guys, I really like what I see with BMY. All right, and last but not least, let's scroll up and jump over to the dividend page real quick, guys, and see what's going on in the dividend department. I've been saying the word department a lot in this video, guys. I apologize for that. It's just something I'm, I'm testing out, so we'll see if it sticks. Um, but in regards to BMY's dividend, they have a forward dividend yield of 3.54%, which is comfortable. Okay, that's a relatively higher dividend yield, I'd say. And they have a payout ratio that's looking pretty swell as well. Currently 26.13%, which is pretty low. And they probably aren't stressing too much about covering these dividend payments with such a low payout ratio. It looks like a lot of their free cash flow is going elsewhere. So if for whatever they needed to contribute more free cash flow to the dividend, they have the room to do so. And then moving on to the five-year CAGR, it looks like that is at 5.22%, which isn't super high. It's not super low. And then they have a dividend growth history of 12 consecutive years, which is steady. Uh, but let's scroll up and go to the dividend history page real quick. So 12 years of consecutive growth, like we just saw, but they have 31 years of consecutive payments, which is awesome. That's a pretty good track record of paying those dividends. And this slope, it's not going up too, too quick, guys, but slowly but surely we're making our way there. 
All right, my friends, moving on to stock number two. Now, you guys knew I was gonna talk about this one. You can't talk about a dividend stock that is plummeting in share price if you're not mentioning AT&T. So as far as share price performance for AT&T, in the last year, they are down 20.76%. Okay, and then in the last six months, they are down 22.15%. Oh my gosh. I should know these stats off the top of my head. I'm checking the stock like every single day and it really doesn't do anything but disappoint shareholders if, if you're looking for share price appreciation from AT&T. Um, we'll see if that changes in the next couple of years. I think a lot of us are holding out for that, um, but you never know, you never know with this company. Um, and then in the last month, they are down a whopping 8.64% in the last 30 days, unreal. And then in the last five days, they're down about 50% of that one month loss. So down 4.83% in the last week or so. Um, and then like BMY, if we zoom out to the five-year mark, we can see that this company has also taken a hit and actually uh, quite a more of a substantial hit in the last five years than what we saw with BMY. AT&T is down 40.3% in the last five years. This company just cannot catch a break. And really guys, if you've been following AT&T at all, then you'll already know what, what this is due to. I mean, this company has made some really bad acquisitions. They've sold these acquisitions for less than what they paid for, which is never good. And as an AT&T shareholder, guys, it hurts to see it performing this way. I'm really, really praying that the tides turn for AT&T. I guess we'll see what happens with the spinoff, but for now, I'm remaining faithful. I do think it's gonna be a positive move for this company, as I've talked about before in some of my videos. I know some of you out there have a different sentiment, which is totally okay. But enough rambling, guys. Let's scroll down and take a look to see what the Seeking Alpha bulls and bears have to say about AT&T. So first of all, T just needs to embrace being a utility and allocate free cash flow to reducing debt and buying back shares. I agree. So side note, guys, after this spinoff with Warner Media, that's what I would really love for AT&T to focus on. I would love for them to focus on continuing to pay down debt, to continue deleveraging because they have so much debt on their balance sheet, which we'll take a look at momentarily. But it's unreal. And I will say that that is a huge anchor for them. That debt is really holding them down. Anyway, moving on to the second bull, the Time Warner with Discovery merger has significant growth potential ahead of it. It does. It's a valuable standalone investment at its current valuation, and it's another example of how AT&T is undervalued. And moving on to the third bull who simply says, an excellent company trading at unacceptably low levels. All right, now let's see what the lone bear has to say about AT&T. The management could end up diverting funds to buybacks or repayment of debt after the spinoff while limiting dividend yield to less than 5%. This might be painful in near term, but help in the long run. Honestly, guys, that doesn't sound too negative to me. That just kind of goes along with some of the stuff we've been talking about so far. They've got to get that debt down. And I would not mind that coming at the expense of a lower dividend yield. I think whatever it takes to get this company in a better position, I think that's what they need to do. And with that said, guys, I'm actually completely fine with AT&T reducing their dividend, even if it ends up being less than 5% that's still a really good dividend yield. A dividend yield above 4% is nothing to turn your nose up at. Um, I know that right now it's like 8.7, 8.8% dividend yield, but you know I have no issues with a, a 4 plus percent dividend yield. I think that's really good, especially if it's gonna help this company put themselves in a better position and, and become better situated for the long run, because that's what it's really all about. And that's also why I'm not stressing too much about the dividend cut, because I'm here to invest for the long run. I have a lot of years of investing left in me personally, which is why I don't mind seeing this move take place because uh, like this bear said right here, it might be short-term pain, but it should help in the long run. All right, guys, now scrolling up, let's go take a look at this company's current valuation. So Seeking Alpha gives it an A grade, which is awesome. Um, it has a low PE ratio, which I'm sure is not surprising to you guys. 6.82, which is actually lower than what we saw with BMY. Scrolling down, they have a perfect, perfect price to book, exactly 1.0. I don't know that I've actually ever seen that, but that is great. And then they also have a really low, really nice price to free cash flow. Just looking at these three metrics, the PE ratio, the price to book, the price to cash flow, oh, it makes me want to buy it, guys. And I sh probably should save this for the portfolio update, but I actually did buy some AT&T this week. Um, I'll tell you guys more about that later on in the video, but while we're on the subject, I thought I'd share that. Anyway, scrolling up, let's take a look at the financials real quick. I just want to zoom through this real quick, guys, because we have two other great stocks to talk about, and I don't want to spend too much time talking about AT&T. So first things first, total revenues, guys, believe it or not, is going up pretty steadily. That's good to see. It looks like 2019 to 2020, they took a little bit of an L, um, but they have since bounced back in 2021 and did more revenue so far in 2021 
than they did in 2020, which is great. Now going over to the balance sheet, guys, let's go and scroll down, take a look at the total debt, which is gonna be high, we already know that, along with the shares outstanding and see how that's moving. So starting with shares outstanding right here, this actually isn't great. It looks like they are issuing more shares as the years go on, or at least between 2017 to 2018, they issued a substantial amount of shares, over 1.2 billion shares issued between those years. Um, but since then, they have brought the number of shares down a little bit by, it looks like about 200 million. Going over to the total debt real quick, no surprise, they are just adding debt like none other. Okay, right now they have over $200 billion in debt, which is basically a $27 billion increase in debt compared to 2020. So. Something's gotta change with AT&T's debt. It's gotta change. Like I said earlier, this is the anchor that is holding them down. Let's jump over to the cash flow real quick and scroll down, take a look at levered free cash flow. So this is going up. Actually, it's going up pretty consistently and it's going up quite a bit. Look at that. Between 2018, 2019, huge jump in levered free cash flow, okay? $15 billion gain. 2019 to 2020, another $2 billion gain. 2020 to now, another $5 billion gain in free cash flow. So this is great to see. And the free cash flow per share is increasing along with this. So with that said, that's all very positive. Do like to see that, guys. Now, the last thing we got to talk about with AT&T is the dividend, which is one of the big reasons a lot of people buy this company. So earlier I said it was like 8.7, 8.8%, but I was wrong, guys. With this really substantial decrease in share price, it is now in the 9% range. Four dividend yield of 9.02% with a payout ratio of 61.58%. It's a little bit on the high end. And then a five-year growth rate of basically nothing, 1.61%. That's very low. Um, but they do have a really high dividend yield. So I guess there's a trade-off there. And then they have zero years of dividend growth, which we already know they're going to cut it. So they're basically starting fresh with the dividend. That's probably the best way to put it. Um, even despite now zero years of growth, which they were prior to this, they did have like 20 something years of growth, consecutive growth, if I do remember correctly. They do have 37 years of consecutive payments. So they are very dedicated to paying this dividend. All right, my friends, moving on to stock number three. It's probably no surprise that I'm talking about this company either, but uh, we have Verizon, ticker symbol VZ. Now, as far as share price performance in the last year, Verizon is down 17.3%, which is a pretty big drop. Okay, in the last six months, they're down about 10.5%. In the last 30 days, they're down about 3.5%. And then in the last week, in the last five days, they're down another 2%. Um, and before we go see what the bulls and bears have to say, there is a actually pretty notable piece of news with Verizon. If we scroll down here, um, this I'll just read the headline. Verizon closes $6 billion acquisition of TrackPhone Wireless, which if, for those of you who are not familiar with TrackPhone, it is a prepaid phone company. Um, and Verizon just picked that up for $6 billion, which could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. It probably will bring in some more revenue for them. They probably took on some debt to make this acquisition, which kind of sucks. Um, but we'll see if it pays off. It could be worth it. Anyway, scrolling down a little bit more, let's take a look and see what the bulls and bears have to say about Verizon. So the first one right here, BZ's valuation is at a cyclical low but its business fundamental prospects are at a cyclical high. Well, that's good to hear. Um, Verizon benefits from its scale as the industry leader. It continues to see net additions to its wireless and broadband segments and pays an attractive yield. Moving on to the third bull, while Verizon's Q3 results and outlook were at least decent, I like this stock primarily for its portfolio diversification benefits. All right, cool. Now moving on to what this one bear has to say. So deflation in the price per gigabyte sent due to the 5G adoption will hinder Verizon from increasing revenues in EBITDA. Okay, I'll probably have to read more into this one. Um, but for now, let's scroll up and take a look at the valuation, guys. So... Seeking Alpha gives it a B plus, but uh, the valuation of Verizon is actually really not too bad. Starting with the forward PE ratio right here, guys, that is sitting at 9.43, which is 20% lower than this company's five-year average PE ratio. So they are coming down in share price and becoming more affordable, like we saw on the summary page a few moments ago. Scrolling down to the forward price to book here, guys, this is also lower than in the trailing 12 months. So the forward price to book is sitting at 2.63, which is about half or about 40% lower than the five-year average, excuse me. And then the price to cash flow is sitting in a great spot, 5.39, which is about 17.5% lower than this company's five-year average price to free cash flow. So all across the board, this company is sitting at a lower valuation than where it has historically has been in the last five years. So at least in comparison to itself across the last five years, Verizon is looking to be at a better valuation. And with all of that said, now let's take a look at some of the financials behind Verizon. So going over to the income statement right here, once it loads, starting with the total revenues, this really hasn't done too much in movement. It's actually been 
relatively flat, I'd say, for the last five or six years, guys. So from 2019 to 2020, they were actually lower in revenue. But then for 2021, guys, it looks like they did substantially more revenue, about $6 billion more in revenue than they did in 2020. So that's good to see. Um, and then jumping over to the balance sheet real quick, let's take a look at um, the shares outstanding as well as the total debt. So just a mental note here, they have $10 billion in cash. Scrolling down, taking a look at the shares outstanding. This is also pretty flat. It's been sitting at about the 4.1 billion shares outstanding range, at least for the last, what is that? For the last three or four years now. Um, and then looking at the total debt, this has also gone up, guys. Definitely something to look out for with Verizon, guys. But um, yeah, it'd be nice to see them pay down this debt as well. Um, scrolling up, let's take a look at the cash flow real quick. I think we'll see that this has increased as time goes on. So levered free cash flow. And the free cash flow looks like it has pretty much gone up across the last five years. It looks like there was a little mishap here in 2019, but they recovered pretty well in 2020. And then even in 2021 here, where is that? Okay, in 2021, they had a really terrible year of free cash flow. They had a 24, basically a 24 and a half billion dollar free cash flow loss in the year 2021. So that sucks. Not sure exactly why this was negative. I'll, I'll have to read more into that. Maybe you guys know more about this than I do, but um, definitely not something we'd like to see. And then the free cash flow per share also in 2021 was negative. So definitely not good, guys. Definitely not good. Let's take a look at the dividends real quick. This is the last thing we'll look at with Verizon. Okay, so Verizon, actually the four dividend yield, I'm surprised to see this in the 5%, but it has officially reached that level with the decrease in share price. And their payout ratio is actually not too bad, 47.6%. This is about 13% lower than what we saw with AT&T. Um, the five-year growth rate's really nothing to write home about either, 2.11%, that's pretty low. And then Verizon has a dividend growth history of eight consecutive years. But if we jump over to the dividend history, we can see that they have 21 consecutive years of dividend payments. So like AT&T, they are committed to at least paying the dividend. All right, guys, and moving on to the fourth and final stock that has really been taking a beating. Uh, this is also a company that I have not talked about in quite a long time on my channel, but this is Campbell Soup Company, ticker symbol CPB. Just going through some of the share price history with this company in the last year, they are down 17.42%. In the last six months, they have taken an 18.41% beating, okay? In the last 30 days, they are actually, I think they're up a little bit once this loads right here. Yeah, so they're up 0.35% in the last month. And then in the last five days, they're down 2.4%. Um, and then like AT&T and like Bristol-Myers Squibb, they are down in the last five years. They're down almost 30% in the last five years. And then just for fun, zooming out to the last 10 years, guys, the last time Campbell Soup was sitting where it is now at about $41 per share was, if we zoom back here, okay, 2019, it was, it was in this level. But then zooming back even more, back in looks like 2013. 2013, it was also at about $41 per share somewhere in there, February, March, 2013. So almost 10 years ago, this company was at the price that it is right now. And with that said, if any of you Campbell Soup shareholders bought any shares back in 2013 and are still holding them to this day, mad respect. My hat's off to you guys because it takes a lot of patience. And I would imagine it takes a lot of resilience to be holding this company for that long and basically see no movement. However, it looks like in 2015, 2016, they did get up to about $66 per share. So there was some movement there, but man, since then it's really come down, really come down a lot, guys. So, all right, guys, now with that said, let's scroll down and take a look and see what some of the Seeking Alpha Bulls have to say about Campbell's Soup. So the first one here says, the integration of Snyder's Lance is still not completed. New management appears to be prudent capital allocators and the company appears to return to sustainable growth. The second one says half of the business is now a snack food company with significant margin expansion potential and the company has capacity to acquire another business after paying off debt. And from what I remember, I don't believe the debt level for this company is too bad. We'll take a look at that in just a moment, but for now, let's go look at the valuation real quick. Jump over to this page right here. So the forward PE ratio, of Campbell Soup is the highest that we've seen all day. Currently sitting at 14.69, which is a little bit lower than the five-year average, about 10% lower, okay? And then scrolling down, looking at the price to book, 3.55. Okay, it's not too bad. I also think that that is the highest price to book that we've seen all day, if I'm remembering correctly. But it also happens to be about 50% lower than this company's five-year average price to book. That is good to see. And then the price to cash flow of Campbell Soup is not too bad as well sitting in the single digits at 9.83. So all across the board, I'd say the valuation is decent um, with the share price currently sitting at 41.13. I do actually think 
it still has some room to come down a little bit. I think if you can get Campbell's Soup under $40 per share, which it's looking like it's headed in that direction. I would not be surprised if Campbell's Soup reaches sub 40 per share. Now jumping over to the financials page, guys, let's take a look at some of these metrics here. So starting with the total revenues right here, once it loads, you know, this has been pretty flat for the last handful of years, as we can see from this chart right here. But if we just go look at these numbers, so 2019, 8.1 billion, 2020, 8.6 billion, 2021, 8.4 billion. It looks like they did have a pretty big jump between 2018 to 2019, but we gotta get back to that point. We gotta keep generating some more revenue. At any rate, let's jump over to the balance sheet, guys, and take a look at the shares outstanding as well as the total debt. Taking a look at the shares outstanding right here, guys. It looks like in the last 10 years, they have brought this down a little bit. It's not a huge slope down, but you can see it is trickling down, which is good to see. Um, it looks like between 2020 and 2021, they didn't buy back any more shares. In fact, between 2019 and 2020, they added 1 million shares, um, but they're really not doing much in terms of issuing or buying back shares. So it's staying pretty pretty steady there. Um, and then looking at the total debt, it did jump up between 2017 and 2018. I'm sure that was for some sort of acquisition, but they have aggressively paid down their debt since then. So I think the debt's in a pretty good spot. I'm, I'm glad to see that they're putting a lot of the cash flow towards paying this back down um, and deleveraging. If they can get it back down to this four, you know, four billion or less mark, which it looks like they probably will um, next year at the rate that they're paying down that they could even get in the threes, depending on how aggressive they are. Um, that's really good to see them making this move right here. And then scrolling up, let's take a look at the free cash flow real quick, guys. So scrolling down, finding levered free cash flow here. Not too bad. It's pretty steady, just like the revenue. Not much growth here. In fact, it has come down a little bit since 2020. So from 2020 to 2021, they did take a little bit of an L for free cash flow. But the years prior to that, it looks like it was going up a little bit. So not too bad. Okay. They're at least able to pay down debt as well as pay the dividend and continue growing the dividend. So that's good to see, which actually brings us to our next point, guys. Let's talk about Campbell Soup dividend real quick. So the four dividend yield for this company, as you can see right here, is 3.65%. They have a payout ratio that's right in the middle of the sweet spot, 53.66%. Not too bad. Their five-year growth rate is really nothing to write home about either, 2.85%, which is... Eh, and then they have a dividend growth history of one consecutive year. Um, but jumping over to the dividend history page, they have a pretty long history of paying that dividend, 32 years straight, okay? And then zooming out to take a look at the max on this chart here. Not much going on with the dividend growth, guys. It was growing here, and then it stayed pretty flat, and then it went up a little bit, went up a little more, and it stayed pretty flat since 2016, okay? And then just now in 2021, they increased the dividend just two cents. All right, my friends, and that's pretty much a wrap on all of the dividend stocks I wanted to talk about today. Now let's switch gears and jump over to my dividend portfolio tracker right here and um, get into the weekly portfolio update. So as you guys can see right here, my portfolio's current market value is $30,639.88, which is pretty much the same as it was last time I updated you guys on this portfolio, which the last time we did an update, it was at $30,678. So we're only down about $32 compared to last week. Um, but with that, guys, the dividend income has jumped up a little bit. It's jumped up about $9 in the last week. And so is the dividend yield. This has gone up a little bit as well, about 0.04%, which really isn't too much. But guys, it's creeping up and it's getting very close to a 5% dividend yield for this portfolio, which is good to see. And then as far as the total gain goes, guys, the current gain of this portfolio is 2.51%, which as you can see on the screen is about 0.7% less than last time we did an update. And in terms of dollars, last time we did an update, it was $955, but now we're at a $750 gain. So we lost about $205 of unrealized gain just in the last week or so. But you know, guys, like I mentioned in the intro to this video, the market had a really rough week. Um, and my portfolio is really no exception to that. In fact, guys, I'd say for the last month, month and a half maybe even, my portfolio has really taken a hit. It really was not too long ago this portfolio was sitting in the double digit gains. I think it was at one point up 12, 13, maybe even more percent. I don't remember exactly how much it was at its highest for unrealized gain, but in terms of dollars, it was like over 2000 over $2,200 of unrealized gains. So 
I've lost a bit of money on the market in the last couple of months, but it's all good, guys. We will bounce back. And really, as I've said before numerous times on this channel, that's a very bittersweet thing because although I've lost some money in unrealized gain, it does mean that my stocks are more affordable to buy, which is great because it means that the money I'm contributing every single week to this portfolio is able to buy me more shares, which is gonna help me generate this cash flow and build this cash flow at a quicker rate compared to if these stocks were sitting higher in price because I wouldn't be able to buy as many shares. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. I know that a lot of you experienced dividend investors out there are more familiar with this concept, but for those of you who are maybe new to dividend stock investing, that is one thing you will learn as you go. And it actually is one of the tenets of dividend investing is we like to buy these stocks at a value. And with that, guys, let's move on. I wanna go over to the portfolio summary page real quick, and I wanna share with you what I bought in the last week. And if you guys have been watching my videos on a regular basis, then I'll bet you can already guess two out of the three stocks I bought in the last week, okay? If you guys know me, you know that I bought some Intel, put $50 into this bad boy right here, and then I also bought some Lockheed Martin right here. And also, if you've been paying attention at all in this video, you'll know the third stock that I bought this week. That was AT&T, and because it's so cheap, only like 23 bucks per share, I was able to get over two shares with a $50 contribution this week, which is awesome. And also, because it was the first week of December, I did get some pretty good dividend payments as well. I got one dividend payment from Intel, I got one from AWR, which is really not a big dividend payment. I think it was only like a couple bucks. If that, it might've been like $3 at most. And then I got my first payment from XYLD, which was very exciting. This one's a monthly dividend payer. So I'm excited to uh, continue getting shares of this each month. And just with the dividend that I got this month, I got like 0.14 shares, which isn't a whole bunch, but getting that every single month. So, you know, that'll definitely help boost my income a little bit. And then as far as next week goes, guys, I'm just gonna keep on keeping on. I'm definitely gonna buy some more Lockheed Martin. I'm definitely gonna buy some more Intel, and I might even possibly buy some more AT&T, guys. I'm not exactly sure how I wanna approach AT&T. I have it in my mind that I'd like to get to and even 100 shares of this company, which it won't take long to get there at all. It probably would take me just, just a few weeks to get there, really, probably three or four weeks. Um, at the rate that I'm buying. But it's also very possible that I don't buy this next week and I forego that to buy something else. Like for example, maybe I buy some more Verizon, which is something that I've also been doing, or maybe I buy some more Altria Group, which is also something that I've been doing lately. I'm now up to 40 shares of Altria Group, which is exciting. But I just don't know, guys. It's actually been kind of fun leaving that third one open is kind of like a flex position is what, kind of what I like to call it. Um, and then with that third $50 contribution, I've just been buying what seems right at the time and what looks to be like a good buy at the time. And this week it looked like AT&T. Um, I was kind of planning on holding off on buying AT&T to be honest with you, because I do see this company continuing to go down in price. Like I said, I would not be surprised if it gets to $20 per share or even below that sometime soon. Um, so maybe I'm not the smartest for buying it right now, knowing it's gonna continue going down, but there's nothing wrong with dollar cost averaging your way down, guys. All right, guys, and that pretty much wraps it up for today's video. Now, I know this one was a relatively longer video, and if you are still here with me at the end, thank you so much. I really appreciate you sticking through with me all the way to the end. Um, if you have not done so already, please don't forget to leave a like, leave a thumbs up on this video before you click on to the next one. And also, before you go, leave me a comment below. Let me know which stocks you guys plan to buy in the upcoming week. I'd be curious to hear what investing moves you all are making. And last thing, guys, if you love dividend stocks and are interested in connecting with some other like-minded dividend stock investors like myself and about 200 other individuals, then look in the description of this video for a link to the free Dividenders Discord server. Essentially what this is, if you guys aren't familiar with Discord, it's basically just a big group chat where a lot of us get together and we talk dividend stocks and we're sharing our portfolios and sharing what we're buying and selling every single week and what we think about various stocks. It's a really positive, like-minded community. So if you're into dividend investing, I highly recommend you join the group. We're having a lot of fun and learning a lot of good things over there from each other. A um, lot of good wisdom and a lot of good knowledge being passed around. So if you are interested in joining the Discord guys, go ahead and click the link in the description of this video, it will take you right there. And with that said, guys, I will now get out of your hair, but thank you once again so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Hope you guys have a great day and I will see you in the next one.